Hi everyone. Uh, so welcome to lecture number 10. Um, amazing how quickly the course is uh, going, right? Um, we're almost done. Now, today I'm going to be talking about the comparison and contrast essay. Uh, sometimes called a comparative analysis, as, as you'll see in a second. Now, I want to give you a, a tip before we get into this, all right? As a matter of fact, you might want to read between the lines. You should never, ever, ever write a comparative analysis unless you are specifically asked to do so. Now, that's going to sound odd, right? Some professors will ask you to do a comparative analysis, and so I'm going to show you how to do it. You don't have to do that for this course, right? In, again, are you reading between the lines? You may not even have to watch the entire lecture. But if you are ever asked to do a comparative analysis, I'm going to show you the way to go about it. So again, please, no comparative analyses for our papers, all right? None, like for the final paper, the exam, I will not ask you to do that, okay? So I just want to be very, very clear on that point. I don't even know how, how much I, like, like I said, don't do that for our course. But if you're asked to do it, I'm going to show you. So here we go, all right? So as I said, you might even want to just skip this lecture. You might want to just put it aside, but hang on to it in case you're asked to do something like this. So I'm just trying to save you some time because I know we're near the end of the course now. Things are piling up and you're getting stressed, like the, right? So I'm trying to just save you some time. That's why I waited to talk about this right now. Okay, sorry, sorry for the preamble, but I want to be very clear. You don't need it for this course. Okay, understood? Good, okay? Go, you know, take a walk or do what you need, but hang on to this, okay, for maybe a, another course later on. All right, so I think, okay, I think I made myself clear. Now, when we talk about a comparative analysis, right, um, basically, the, 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 the terms are very subtle. It's kind of like, when, remember when we talked about argument and persuasion and how subtle those two terms were, or the differences were? The same thing with comparative uh, co uh, comparison and, and contrast. When we point out similarities, we're talking about comparing. When we point out differences, then we're talking about contrasting. <laughs> I mean, that, that's it. That, that's the difference between the two. And so when we assess both similarities and differences, then we are engaging in comparison and contrast. Okay? And so by the time we get to the end of this lecture today, You'll see why I'm suggesting that you should never do this unless you're specifically asked to do so. And I'm going to give you a couple of hints on, on how to approach the, the, the organizational patterns and, and what questions you should ask your professor if you're, ever, if you're ever asked to do something like this. All right. So often, OK, we use the, the term comparison to actually mean both comparing and contrasting. Like, 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 as I said, people use it interchangeably. And so that's why, if you notice in your notes there, I've called it a comparative analysis. And that's what we're talking about. And so compar uh, comparison, is it, it's a natural process we do all the time. Think about, think about when you woke up today, all right, you compared. In other words, you chose different, you know, <laughs> things that you would wear around the house or like whatever your outfit was um, and so so we're comparing all the time all the time when we when we choose certain things to eat or whatever we're comparing all right but if we get a bit more specific there's a few things that we actually want to think about when it comes to comparative analysis and so I'm going to show you the three questions right first of all okay so these are the questions you should be asking if you're ever doing a comparative analysis all right First of all, what are the main similarities between S1 and S2 when S equals the subject? So in other words, whatever whatever we're comparing, all right, or contrasting, okay? Now, keep in mind, right, notice, notice the words, the main similarities, all right? So again, you, you want to start thinking about how do we turn a simple comparative analysis into an argument? And that's the key, and that we're going to come back to that in about 45 minutes, all right? In other words, am I supposed to just compare, or do I create an argument? So one of the ways to think about that would be, what are the main similarities? Not just similarities, but the main. 
So notice when we talked about your uh, causal analysis, right? Cause, and, cause or effect paper. What were the most significant? Not just three important ideas or whatever, the most significant. So keep that in mind too. And then of course, number two, what are the differences between S1 and S2? But you can see how vague that is, right? So, and then finally, what are the main similarities and differences between S1 and S2? So I hope you can see almost immediately how vague this becomes. And so in school or maybe at work, right? Like, like once you graduate or, or maybe now if you have a job and, and your, your job entails a, a bit of writing, right? You can use the comparative analysis pattern for a, a couple of different reasons, right? Um, you can use it to inform. So that, that's, and that is actually where comparative analysis works the best, when you're simply informing. Then you can also use it to evaluate. And so to evaluate is a bit different, and I'll, I'll move into that as we go along. Like, like in, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself here, so I'm, I'm going to leave it at that, all right? So when we talk about evaluation, right? Actually, we're, we're probably talking more about something like a business proposal. But as I said, give me another page or two, and you'll see what I mean. And so let's just say, let's just say, okay. So in the lecture today, I'm gonna to start by asking a question. So let's just say you had an exam question and it said, what are the, the, the similarities and differences, okay, between say an IBM and a Mac computer? So again, how do you approach that? because uh, uh, am I supposed to provide an argument there, right? Well, the first thing we want to think about is, okay, how do we set it up to begin with, all right? And so, and so, next thing, how, the technique. If you are writing a comparative analysis, right, there are three questions, three crucial questions that you want to consider, right? And they are, first of all, are the two items really comparable? So, Again, th this comes down to, you know, your research and, um, well, it, it comes down to a couple of things, actually, but are they really comparable? Number two, what are the terms of comparison? And right there, we can stop and talk for 10 minutes. I'm not going to, but what I mean is we can elaborate. When I say the terms of comparison, what do you think I'm talking about? Well, if you recall, right? Throughout the entire course, I've been trying to show you how to structure a paper. And so the terms of comparison would be equivalent to your section headings. In writing, all writing, no matter what we're writing, it all works the same way. There is a certain structure or a pattern, right? So when I say the terms of comparison, and notice I have term, the word terms highlighted, I'm sorry, bolded, right? The terms simply mean again, those section headings. Remember, the woman was confident, intelligent, and articulate. Boom, boom, boom. Now, and, and there's, there's a thousand other words that we could use, right? I'm gonna show you a few in a second. But the idea is to create a sense of structure. And so that's why I have the word terms bolded. Terms, if you're actually writing and taking notes, terms at the end of that, in parentheses, write section headings. Okay, we got that? So section headings. Now, and then finally, what, like once we figured out the first two, in other words, okay, are, are, the, term, are, are the, uh, the two items really comparable? And by the way, I'm gonna show you how to manipulate that as well. In other words, we can, al we can make almost anything comparable. Right? It has to do with number two, the terms of comparison. So, okay, I hope you see what I'm, what I'm suggesting there. Number one and two, right? You might think there are two things that are not comparable, but if I set up my terms of comparison correctly, then yes, I can create a, a really good comparative analysis. Okay, so, and then finally, what is the uh, most appropriate uh, organizational pattern right, to use? I'm going to show you those. That's where we're going next. So, a couple of things to consider, all right? We have to remember that there must be a meaningful similarity between the two subjects that we are, or, or the number of subjects that we are creating, okay? Or, or that we are comparing, sorry. 
And so they must have, and then again, notice I bolded this, they must have something significant in common. But you see, again, this is where the really good writer can manipulate information. We can force things to actually have significance in common. And so I, I, we talked about that a bit when I was talking about uh, the, the 15 steps and how we impose, right? So, and you'll see that as we go along. So let's just take a look here. After you're, you've decided that, yes, as a matter of fact, I can take these two subjects and, and compare them in a meaningful way, right? Then, as I said, you consider the terms of comparison. So I'm, I'm simply, sorry, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I'm simply going through the notes now. I want to make sure you understand what I mean by that. Because as I said, the, the terms of comparison, well, okay, in, in your final essay, for instance, you, well, you won't be comparing. You won't be comparing, but you'll still have those terms that take you through the essay the section headings, okay? So, like I said, uh, it's kind of similar to what I said in, in lecture nine, where I said a lot of this stuff might be repetitive, okay? It's not really repetitive, but, but I'm reinforcing many of the structural patterns that I've already tried to show you. And so the same thing here, okay? And so, let's just say you were asked to assess, okay, two engineering firms. Well, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to compare the management structure okay, and computer systems of one firm to the washrooms and, con and cafeteria food of, of another. Okay, obvious, obvious, right? Okay, but let's just say I then manipulated my information. I manipulated my terms of comparison or, or like I said, for, your fun like, uh, for any paper, I manipulated my section headings. Now notice, okay, basically I could have done this instead. So I've jumped a line or two. I could have said instead, okay, here are my sec section headings now. Management structure, computer systems, employee facilities. So initially it looked like th what I was trying to do didn't make any sense whatsoever. But by manipulating my section headings, now I can fit the information in to create a nice smooth paper, okay, or report. And that, by the way, that, that's kind of where I'm, I'm heading at the end of this lecture today. When we talk about comparative analysis, quite often, it's, it's not, as I said, it's not the best way to write an essay at university, but it comes in very handy when you're writing reports, okay, and you may have to do that. So anyway, so did we see what I just did there? Let's go back and do that again. We've got management structure, computer systems and of one firm, and cafeteria food of, of another. Like, in other words, okay, my, my information doesn't make any sense. But then I manipulate it. I create section headings, and that gives me that nice smooth structure in which now I can, I can actually manipulate the language, okay, the ideas, to make everything fit. That's what a good writer does, right? In, in other words, I think I've said this like again a hundred times. Sometimes things fall into place. Remember what we did? I can't even remember now what lecture it was, where we talked about um, a sport franchise and we talked about management and then you know players and then like outcome. In other words, championships or whatever. Okay, so that worked. It, it worked. But that doesn't. That's not usually how a paper will 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 unfold. You have to impose, you have to think about how do I put all this together? So that's what I'm trying to show you here. So even though, like I said, I do not want a comparative analysis for your final essay, the same principles apply to any paper, all right? Terms, okay, what are your, your headings? What, are you, what sections are you working through? Most of you are getting that by now, by the way. Okay, I've been pleased to see, all right? But just keep working on that. And I think then you'll see how the structure of a paper evolves. Okay, so here we go, all right? So, as I said, so now we're left with management structure, computer systems, and employee facilities. Right, boom, boom, boom. Right, nice, like, nice and straightforward. So, as I said, think about then your sub subject headings, and that's why uh, in the notes here, I now say, okay, let's go back to the whole idea of you being asked to write a comparative analysis of an IBM and Mac or what have you, right? So we're simply going to talk about basically uh, a comparative analysis of computer systems. So we have computer A, computer B, and computer C. 
it, again, X, Y, Z. Oh, it, it doesn't matter, right? Everything works the same way, right? So it, like the, 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 the individual material, right? The, the actual names or what have you, they should be interchangeable. Everything works the same way, A, B, C. So there are many aspects, as, as a matter of fact, Many of you, some of you have been emailing us asking, okay, so which are the best reasons or which one should, ideas should I include in my, it's up to you. It's up to you to figure out which ones do you think are the most important. But I'm pretending right now that I've determined the three most important. If I'm going to buy a computer system, they're going to be speed. Okay. Sorry. They're going to be price. So P speed S and maintenance M. Okay, so there's the three. There are the three things that I've decided after after doing all of my research. I've decided those are the three things that are most important for my purposes. Again, you could choose whatever you think are the most important. Okay, but that's what I decided. The only reason why I'm showing you this is because I want you to look now at the subject head, the way that I'm going to set up this paper. Okay, and again, again, this will work for any paper, right? So. When we look at a comparison and contrast model, okay, which is, by the way, the one that is, is probably the most common when it comes to uh, business purchasing reports. So, again, we're not doing that in this course. I'm, I'm showing you something that maybe you can use outside of the university. Okay, There's two fundamental models that you can work with, and they're very simple, but yet choosing the right one can be crucial to the way in which your report unfolds. And uh, so, so watch what I do here. Okay, we're on page three now. All right. Okay, so I have model one. So I could set up my paper with my purpose and scope. That's usually what uh, like any kind of business model begins with, right? Um, um, any kind of uh, um, proposal begins with. But it's more or less my introduction. Okay. But as I said, if you if you ever want information on stuff like that, right, you can always email me. Like I've got tons on it. I'm just I'm just trying to show you how you set up any any paper, regardless of whether it's comparison and contrast. So watch. So I could do right. Okay, my first sub subject heading is going to be computer A. Then I'm going to do price, speed, maintenance. Then I'm going to do computer B, price, speed, maintenance. Then I'll do computer C. You do not want to ever set up a paper that way, ever. Okay, that's what I've been trying to show you all along. When you have a subject that is the sub, like it becomes the the heading for a section, right? And then you do A, B, and C. That's where we create re repetition and a lack of development. So let's look at the other model. Okay, because I again I noticed this on some of the papers that, that came through in the term. In model two, I've got my introduction, my right? Pur purpose and scope, whatever. Like I'm I'm using term terminology that is a bit different than what we're used to, but that's how you would set it up for a business proposal. But now look at the section headings: price, speed, maintenance. So by doing it that way, okay, as opposed to computer A, computer B, computer C, by, by choosing price, speed, and maintenance, now I've got subject headings that allow for development. I can bring in computer A in price, right, and computer B, but then maybe in speed, I talk about computer B and computer C. In, in other words, I'm not doing the same thing every time. And so in high school, some of you were shown, right, there's, again, we're going back to like lecture five now, I think. You were shown, okay, make your point and then develop your point with three other points. And you don't want to do that, all right? It, it, it creates for very redundant, choppy writing. The writing becomes too obvious. And so notice here, right, notice, notice my section headings, right? They're not the subjects, computer A, computer B, and computer C. No, they're almost... Plot points, if you want, price, speed, maintenance. That's how you set up every good paper, right? By getting the right terminology to create your section headings. 
And so, and I think most of us are getting that. We're like we're we're we're, we're beyond where we started. Uh, I, I do believe that. All right. So notice the su subject headings, right? Price, speed, maintenance. Boom, boom, boom. So if you remember, that goes back to parallel structure. Don't if, if you don't remember that, you know, you can go back to your notes. It's it's there. I believe it's in lecture seven. I'm I'm not, I'm not sure, but the whole idea of being consistent in the way in which you express. Okay. And so, let's look, take a look at then at the end. Notice where I have recommendations. Now that's a bit odd because in a normal like in, in an essay you wouldn't have recommendations, right? So that's why I keep telling you this information is important if you are out in the business world and you act you have to actually write a proposal, right? Well, then you might have to actually make recommendations. But it would be it would be similar to a conclusion, right? Again, though, at the end of the lecture today, I'll, I'll elaborate on what I mean by recommendations. But again, don't do that for our final essay. Don't do that. So remember, if you're still watching this lecture, you're only watching it because it might help you when you graduate or in other courses, not for ours. OK, let's be clear. Let's be clear. Right. OK. And so. Um, yeah, so I think most of that is is pretty straightforward. And so now we simply have to choose then when we're writing something like this. OK, so what pieces of information will serve as our section headings? What do we think are the most important? Right. And then again, I'm just going right through the, the notes here. So pretty straightforward. All right. OK. Um, and remember back, some of you are still having problems with structure. Uh, structure, it, it's so important that you think about those subject headings that I'm talking about, right? Simply because it gives you that, that roadmap, right? It gives you an idea of how do I get through the material? So we're at, we're at lecture 10 now, right? And I've been talking about that all along, but some of you are still having a bit of a, diff, uh, bit of a problem with, with setting up your paper, okay? So watch out for that. Now, and keep in mind that, that I think the next thing we're gonna talk about Quite often, that structure is something you have to impose. It, it, it doesn't magically appear. So that's something you want to think about. I, the, a couple of papers, it, it's amazing. I received email from a couple of you, and, you, and the way in which you expressed your, your structure in the email, which was really short, was perfect. Then you went and wrote your paper, and you reverted back to your high school teachings, right? And it, it, your ideas were all over the place. So stick to the model that you choose, right? If you've got section one, section two, section three, keep your focus, right? What am I talking about in section one? What am I doing? In, in other words, again, my, my terms, okay? Keep the focus. Don't just go off on a tangent. And that's what many writers tend to do in first year university, okay? Well, more than first year university. So, so watch out for that, okay? And so as we look then at uh, page four, we must impose a sense of structure. As I said, there's no fairy dust that, you know, that will automatically explain this stuff. No, you have to think about the material and ask yourself, okay, what, what order what do I put this in? Remember 15 steps, management, players, outcome, all that. And so also when it comes to your final paper, especially, Think about the idea that once you have a grouping, that grouping is not a paragraph, it's a section. And that section can be broken down into subsections. And so that's something else that you wanna start thinking about. Remember, remember, we're progressing as a writing course. We're, we're hoping that you improve and you start to figure this stuff out. So watch out for that as well. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of jumping a bit in the notes here because I'm, I, I have other things. But, but basically what I'm suggesting is that's how we impose a sense of structure. Structure doesn't just, you know, fall into place, okay, or at least rarely. Quite often you have to impose it. So that's why I have halfway down the page on uh, page four of the notes, right, that, that there's something you have to think about. And we went through that. We've been through that. So as I said, a bit of a review now. I should mention, by the way, if you're still watching, um, this is more or less the last lecture. And um, uh, we'll be doing, in the next lecture, we'll be doing the uh, the exam template, 
right? So I'm trying to just give you an idea of things you want to remember, right, for all of your writing, all of your writing. And so basically, all right, um, it takes it takes a bit of practice and it takes a bit of courage to say, all right, how do I impose my ideas onto the structure of this paper? And as I said, there's, there's no magical way to do that. But if you think about it, take a look at the words that I have here. So you might have words like historical, statistical, environmental, okay, whatever, political, economic. How do I set up my structure? What are the terms, right, that I'm actually arguing? I, again, I almost wanted to say terms of comparison, but you don't want to do that. I'm only showing you in a moment. I'm going to show you how to do that for a comparative essay. Don't do that for your final paper, all right? You're going to make, you're going to create an argument. And again, we're almost into what I'm going to show you for comparative analysis. So anyway, the possibilities, as I said, for, for setting up your terms, they're endless. I mean, there's you know, thousands of, of, of different words that you could use to impose a sense of structure. And so once you have all of your ideas, once you think that you've set up some kind of, you know, like, like terms of, uh, of argument, etc., then there's simply two patterns, and I'm going to show you them right now. Okay, I might I might pause here because it's a uh, quite a bit that we're, we're going to do next. We're almost half hour into the lecture, but there's simply two ways that you set up any kind of comparative analysis. Very straightforward. One is called the chunk pattern, and one is called the slice pattern. And again, I'm not making this up like this is, again, straight out of the uh, Canadian Practical Stylist, right? And so um, when you think about essays in terms of comparative analysis, and again, I'm only showing you this for other courses in case you have to, you know, if, if you're ever asked to do this, there is the chunk pattern, which sets up for very short papers, okay? Then there is the slice pattern, and that works better for longer papers. And so just before, um, I, I'm going to take just a quick break here. Um, yeah, so the chunk pattern, basically what we do, and let me show you a problem now with comparative analysis, all right? So in the, comp in, in the chunk pattern, what you do is you separate the two subjects into like al almost two different papers. You talk about subject one, okay, and you go through everything you want to talk about. Then you talk about subject two. Now the problem with that is, let's just say let's just say you were writing a ten-page paper, and you did that. Well then, basically, as I said, you've got two different papers operating, and the reader is probably not going to remember anything you talked about in the first five pages. So I'm going to show you how you would actually, you know, change all that to create a much more effective comparative analysis. On the other hand, when would you use something like the chunk pattern, like the, you know, subject one, whole topic, subject two, whole topic? Well, that's when, let's just say you were asked to do a comparative analysis and you were only asked to write a page. Well, then something like that would work. So, as I said, let me let me just take a break here just for a moment, okay? I just want to check one other thing, but I think we're, we're good to go. And then, yeah, I'm going to come back and we'll start with the chunk pattern. Then we'll go through the slice pattern. Okay, so just give me one second. Not long. Okay, so um, if you have your notes in front of you, it's pretty straightforward, right? I, like, I don't even know how much I need to elaborate. In the first example, let's just say we were going to do a comparative analysis of a novel, right? And uh, a novel that was turned into a film. So Harry Potter, whatever. So you begin with your introduction, then you would have your first section. Now notice I have paragraph two, but again, I hope we're evolving from that. But we have our first section. Now, in the first section, I deal with the novel, characters, setting, plot. So everything in the first section, okay, all has to do with the, uh, the novel. Then in my next section or paragraph, we have the film, character, setting, plot. So you can see 
If this was a, in a very, very short answer, okay, that might work, right? But if we were writing a longer answer, oh my goodness, you basically have two different essays. I hope you can see that. So again, I'm not asking you to do that for this course, but if ever you're asked to do this, be aware, right? So if, if, it's, if, if it's a one-page answer, okay, that'll work, that'll work, right? The reader can retain the information. And then we conclude, right? Summarizing, similarities, differences, what have you. I hope you realize, by the way, how vague all of this is. I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna come to that in just a moment, right? Writing a comparative analysis can be incredibly vague unless there is a specific purpose behind it. So let's just keep going, right? And then I'll, I'll, I'll get to the more specifics at the end. The more specifics, that wasn't very good grammar, anyway. So the overall structure then, I'm back on the notes now, I'm about three quarters down on page five. So the overall structure of the chunk comparison, okay, will communi communicate the essentials about subject one, then communicate essentials about subject two. And so, as I said, it w maybe you might come across this on an exam, okay? Those of you maybe who are in business or economics, okay? And so, as I said, if they're only asking for a very short answer, then yeah, th that, that pattern will work. But for the most part, almost every other time, you'll actually be wanting to use what we call the slice pattern. And remember, these aren't my terms, like this is just the language that is used in, in textbooks, all right? And so, in the slice pattern, obviously, we set up the terms or categories of comparison, and then we discuss either subject, okay, as we move along, okay? So, I don't think I said that very clearly. What I mean is, like, in each section, we will deal with both rather than having an entire paper dealing with one and then the other. So let's take a look now. I'm on page six. So let's take a look now at an essay that would be structured in the slice pattern. All right. Okay. So you communicate the exact same information that you would in the chunk pattern or what have you, right? But the shape and the outline, okay, would be quite different. So Here's your sample template. And again, you know, not for our course, but for down the road, for just your own writing. Hang on to, like, hang on to this lecture, all right? Because as I said, you may be asked to do this. This is handy. And this is probably the pattern you want to use almost, almost always. It's called the slice pattern. So how do we do it? Very simple. We begin with our introduction. Right. So and of course, like our sections of argument or terms of comparison, thesis statement. No, notice the way lang like the words are almost interchangeable. When I said sections of argument, terms of comparison, same thing. Remember to do that in your in, in your essays. All right. And especially for the final essay for ours. Don't do a comparison, but remember your your your, your sections of argument. All right. So here we go again. And so here. Right. Notice what I've done. We have the introduction with the thesis statement. And then in section one, we will talk about characters. So notice we're not talking about the novel, right? Remember, remember what I looked at before with computer A as opposed to price, right? I'm doing the same thing here. So now my section heading is characters. So I look at characters in the novel and the film. Now I've got a better structure, right? Then I look at maybe setting. Maybe not the best word, but, but I think you understand what I mean. Novel and film. So again, is that a paragraph? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's two or three paragraphs because it's a section. Then we have the plot. And then we have the novel and film. And so the paper works so much smoother, right? In other words, we don't have two different papers operating now things are overlapping and connecting. That's what you want to be thinking about if you ever have to do a comparative analysis. And so, and that takes us then to our conclusion, right? And remember, if you are, uh, remember back to when we were talking about uh, paragraphing and conclusions, right? So you reinforce what you just did and why you did it. But again, I hope you're noticing it's still, it's still vague. 
you must be like if, if you're still with me right now you're wondering well what what's the purpose of doing all this and that's a really good question I would not know if I asked you to do for our course if I asked you to do a comparative analysis I wouldn't have a clue how to grade it seriously and I'm being very serious about that I would not know how to grade a comparative analysis like how do how, how do I say that one comparative analysis is better than another so Again, you want to be wary of these things. Now, 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 don't be talking to other professors and suggesting they shouldn't do it, okay? Because they have their own methods. What I'm trying to show you here, though, is always avoid it if you can, right? Avoid a comparative analysis if you can. At the end, I'm going to show you some questions that you should ask your professor if you're asked to do this. So, a couple of things, right? We've still got about another 20 minutes or so. So, let's just take a look at a couple of other things. And so, as I said, in the slice pattern, okay, we're still on page six now. In the slice pattern, that is a, a pattern that is that that is much better suited for for longer papers, okay, or reports. Reports. It's funny. The comparative analysis examples that I'm giving you here do work better for reports, okay. So, um, yeah, where where basically the 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 terms of comparison are complex and demand uh, a higher reader recall. So again, as I said, who knows? You might get a summer job or you might get a full-time job where in fact you have to do this stuff. I think it's important that you understand it, all right? Okay, I'm, for the 20th time, I'm gonna say, don't do it for our final paper, okay? Anyway, all right. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the problem with a thesis statement when it comes to the comparative analysis. So let's take a look at one. We're at the bottom of page six now, all right? Subject one and subject two can be compared in terms of A, B, and C. Well, I mean, technically, if all you were asked to do was to write a comparison, then that should be fine, right? Like you've done what you were asked to do. But what's the problem? The problem is it's vague. You could write about a thousand different things and you're not, you're not re like I can, I could compare, I, I, I can look around my room right now and compare that wall with that wall. And I can do that forever. What's the purpose? So that's why I'm suggesting be careful when you're asked to do a comparative analysis. So let me give you a couple of examples and then I'll show you a better one. X and Y doesn't matter what the subject matter is. I keep trying to show you that the subject matter does like the subjects don't the the subject matter it 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 it, it, it it's it, it's inconsequential. Try and think about putting stuff in the right order, figuring out the structure. Right? I'm getting very dramatic now, but but you understand what I mean? Like some of you will write. Um, you'll write me an email, and you'll 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 be you'll be so much worried about the the, the the particularities. It's like no, think about the structure. Like by the time you're done this course, you don't want to have to ask. All right, now will this work this time? You should know. Yes, it will work because I put it all together in the proper order. So S1 and S2 can be compared in terms of A, B, and C. Okay, sure, yeah, yeah, I guess they can. But what's the point? So my example would be X and Y. So going back to what I just said about the material doesn't matter, the subject matter, right? Can be compared in terms of their power bases, religious backgrounds, and family ties. I think I was I was thinking about um, um, yeah a couple of prime ministers that that there was there were similarities and differences. So but but again, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the example was. Okay. So yeah, we could do that, but you can see how, all right, like, like what is the point of doing that? Now, then, I'm on top of page seven. We could do subject one and subject two can be contrasted in terms of A, B, and C. Well, once again, yeah, sure, I guess they could be, but you do see the problem, right? So college and university can be contrasted in terms of cost, instruction, and orientation. Yeah, that's true. But is there a better way? Is there a better way that we could elevate that so that we actually 
And, and this becomes the question when it comes to a comparative analysis. Am I supposed to simply do a comparison or do I create, am I supposed to create an argument? So take a look here. Based on A, B, and C, whatever they are, and of course A, B, and C are our section headings, right? So we all know that. The research indicates the best, the best approach would be, and then you actually make a statement, right? So it's interesting how in a comparative analysis, the question becomes, right, am I supposed to simply create a comparison or am I supposed to create an argument? And that's crucial. So let's think about a couple of things here, all right? The question in a comparative analysis then becomes, do I need an argument? Okay. And so there's a few more things I want to talk about, but let's just consider if you were asked to do, let's just say you were asked to do a comparative analysis in another course. Okay. Not for us. You might be smart to sit back and wait until the class is done. Okay, and then once the course, once the class is done, go down individually. Don't ask in front of everybody else. Okay, I'm trying to give you a, a little way of getting a, a bit of a head start on, on grades here. So wait, and then go down to your professor or instructor and ask a couple of questions. For instance, okay, are you expected to create an argument? Right. In, in other words, in a comparative analysis, okay, with, with all the stuff that I've shown you here, we could go on forever. But are we supposed to come to some sort of conclusion? And that is crucial to any comparative analysis. So ask the instructor or your boss. Right. OK. Well, actually, in a moment, I'll, I'll show you a couple of other things that will explain about your boss. So, uh, yeah, are you supposed to create an argument? And it's, it's easy to do, okay, based on what I just did earlier. Based on A, B, and C, the research indicates the best approach would be. So in other words, once you've done your comparative analysis and all that, then you can have a section at the end. So it works very differently from the regular argument, right? You would have a section at the end that basically then showed why, one, let's go back to our computer example, right? Why IBM is, is better suited for our corporation than Mac, okay? Or vice versa, it doesn't matter. So based on all the other information. So you can see how a comparative analysis, it doesn't work quite the same way as the argument that, that I've been showing you all along. Okay. And so that's, and so you, you would conclude then with something like based, based on A, B, and C, the research indicates the best approach would be right. And there you go. All right. And so, um, so you ask, ask your instructor again, okay, again, especially if you're in business, Okay, you want to know, am I supposed to come up with some kind of argument? Okay, well, or am I simply expected to show similarities and or differences? Is that, is that all you want? But again, you see, I can, I can almost guarantee you, even if your instructor said that, that, that he or she only wants similarities and differences, if you create an argument to go along with your comparative analysis, you'll do much better. I can, I can guarantee you that, all right? So like subconsciously, when, when someone is reading a report or whatever, if that's already like, like being germinated in their minds, I can almost guarantee you that you'll do better, right? So, but as I said, ask that question. Now, um, will you be expected to propose recommendations? If you go back to, I believe it was, let me just check my notes here. Yeah, if you go back to page three, at the end of the little model I showed you with our computers, right? Choosing the computer systems. At the end, I had recommendations. Well, obviously, in, in a regular essay, you wouldn't have something like that, okay? But in a business proposal, for instance, quite often you would. And so, and, and, and business proposals quite often do comparative analyses. So if you had to do recommendation, or, or I should say, are you, you'll want to ask, do I have to propose recommendations. And so if you do have to do that, right, then there is a possibility, right, 
that someone will have to act, I'm going back to the notes now, someone will have to act on whatever findings you come up with. And that, that's basically, as I said, it's that, that's the way business works, all right? So, and, and, and that's usually where we find comparative analyses. So, will someone have to act on my findings? Well, if they have to act on your findings, right? Well, then you have to kind of lead them into that direction. Uh, and if any of you have worked in government, especially, you know, a bit higher up, you understand exactly what I'm talking about, okay? So, basically then, um, the final two questions that I have there, okay? Would you be expected to propose recommendations? Will anyone have to act on your findings? For the most part, that will not apply to your university career. But as I said, if you ever have to write a business proposal, or if your job entails doing research and then putting that research into practice, right? Or at least making suggestions on how that research should be put into practice, then I think it's important that we understand basically how we put something like, like information like this together, all right? So, um, as we come to the end of the lecture today, okay, we're almost, almost 50 minutes into it, right, 40, 48, um, think, about, think about a couple of things, all right? So, let me just repeat, because I want to be incredibly clear about this. I do not, not want you to write a comparative analysis for your final paper, okay, at all. They create vagueness, they are problematic, uh, I, I've, I've seen in, in, in English courses, for instance, where professors ask to, you know, compare two different novels. I, I have no idea how you would grade something like that. All right. So I do not want you to do that. On the other hand, you may have other courses which actually do ask you to do a comparative analysis. Okay. Well, if you happen to come across that, then think about the questions that I that I gave you, right? Do I need an argument? How do I set it up? Well, I've, I've given you that. So, so when you go into creating a comparative analysis, the question, the final question becomes, am I simply doing a comparison or a contrast right? or both, which my goodness is, is unbelievably okay, obtuse, all right? I mean, <laughs> obtuse is not the right word but just it creates va vagueness like you wouldn't believe. Instead, the question becomes, is that all I'm doing or uh, am I creating an argument? And so let's just go do one more thing, right? We're almost at 15 minutes. Let's just go back and look at page seven, okay? Because your notes should still be on the table. So college and university can be contrasted in terms of cost, instruction, and orientation. Okay, well, yes, that's true. And I could write 10,000 pages on that, or I could write a page. Based on A, B, and C, the research indicates the best approach would be. So notice right away, I'm actually turning the same information into an argumentative tone. That's maybe the final thing that I wanna talk about today. Some of you are still not understanding argumentative tone and it's 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 very simple on your second paper you might have written about a whole lot of historical information okay but if you don't use words like most important most influential then your essay becomes more of a narrative than it does an argument and so small things, little things, right? And I, I think I began the whole course with this, right? Little things like saying that this is the most important, like in other words, taking a stand, that's what creates argumentation. That's the problem with comparative analysis, right? Comparative analysis quite often will not have an argument. And so keep that in mind for your final paper stay in the argumentative, or argumentative mode, all right? And so as we close today, okay, we're almost up to 50 minutes now. Um, think about, just think about the argumentative tone, right? Uh, again, like watch out for any narrative, okay? Um, simply telling a story. Instead, you wanna take a stand. In week two, we, we started talking about that. Take a stand with your final paper.
right? Is something good or bad? Make it clear. What did I talk about in lecture nine at the very end? Make it clear okay, which side you're on and then stick with that side and work it through. And so that's the end of lecture 10 for the most part. Um, in lecture 11, I will be now talking about the final exam. And so that's going to, that's a fluid situation at the moment because of everything that's going on. And so I'll probably give you a generic explanation of the exam. Not, not like, like you'll have everything you need, but there, I probably won't mention dates or times or things like that. And instead what I'll do is I'll email all of that because that's going to change as we move forward. The university is still figuring out a few things on that. Um, and so, as I said, I, I want to make sure that, that you have the information you need, but at the same time, I don't want to give specific information which might lead you astray. So as I said, in lecture 11, it's not going to be very long. It'll probably be about a half an hour at the most. And it'll basically more or less explain almost everything you need to know for the exam itself. But as I said, it won't include time or date. All right. I'll do that through email. OK, so um, other than that, um, again, now that's lecture 10. We're almost done. It's amazing how quickly this course went by. So I'll um, be working on the final two lectures. Um, and as I think I mentioned before, lecture 12, who knows? I might just, you know, do a quick video saying hi goodbye or whatever. Yeah, norm normally in, in lecture 12, what we would do is we would have, um, you know, handing back assignments and making sure that everything is, you know, like I, I have everything I need to, to make the final grade. But because we're doing it electronically, we probably won't need to worry about that. But but again, though, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. So that's it for today. Um, that's lecture 10 now in the books. And uh, I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye.